let's get into the word. Uh, 1 Kings 15 tonight. Again, we'll just do one chapter, a lot here, uh, as there was the last couple of weeks. So uh, why don't you turn there if you're not there already, and uh, once you're there, we'll pray and ask God's blessing on our time together in his word. So if you would join with me. Loving Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you for your word. Lord, we're here tonight because we want to be in your word and have your word be in us and richly dwell in our hearts. And Lord, we're also here because we want to hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit speak and minister to us. And Lord, we're also here tonight because we anticipate that you're going to do a great and grand and glorious work in our midst, in and through your word, as you're always so faithful to do. And Lord, lastly, thank you so much for this church extending our lease until we get into our new building. And Lord, we do pray that there will be no other need for additional comments or clarification on our plans and that we'll get our final main building permit uh, tomorrow, if possible. And we know with you all things are possible. So we just lay that before you and trust that with you. So Lord, thank you again for this time together in your word. We pray your blessing on it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. In the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, Abijam became king over Judah. He reigned three years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacha, the granddaughter of Abishalom, which means father, my father is peace. And verse 3, he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. His heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. Nevertheless, for David's sake, verse 4, the Lord his God gave him a lamp in Jerusalem by setting up his son after him and by establishing Jerusalem because David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and had not turned aside from anything that he had commanded him all the days of his life except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. We're going to come back to that here in just a bit. Something I want to point out here at the start, because once again, it's something that will be germane to our understanding of Israel's kings. The kings throughout Israel's history during the period of the kings we're told that they either did that which was right in the Lord's sight or they did that which was evil in the Lord's sight. And it's interesting to note that good kings would come from bad kings and conversely, vice versa, evil kings would come from good ones. Now, why do I mention that? Because this alone to me single-handedly dismantles and destroys really the false teaching that's known as generational curses. Uh, more specifically in terms of what generational curses means is that the children pay for the sins of the father. And what's sad is that and this has been around for a long time, this wind of doctrine, as James would refer to it as. It's been around as long as I've been a Christian. I've been a Christian for over 30 years. And I remember this back in the early 80s, this whole thing of, you know, generational curses. You've got to break the chain, the generational curse. And here, here we are all these years later, and this false doctrine, this false teaching is seemingly still gaining traction today. Uh, we did a study on this back when we were going through the book of Exodus, 
and studying through the Ten Commandments, which has a mention of uh, the visiting of the iniquities of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation. And uh, what I want to do, if you'll kindly indulge me just for a little bit, is revisit this false doctrine of generational curses and explain why it is that it is so dangerous and it is such a false teaching and if you think about it it is a smack in the face of Jesus himself and the finished work on the cross if the cross did not break all of those curses and set captives free which Isaiah says is what the Savior came to do. Now, we find a mention of God visiting the sins of the fathers a total of four times in the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses. The first is in the context of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. I'll read verses 4 through 6. It says, You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth you shall not bow down to them nor serve them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God listen visiting listen carefully visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. The second time we read it is in Exodus 34, verses 6 through 7. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That doesn't sound like punishing anybody for any curses generationally <laughs> uh, merciful gracious long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth keeping mercy for thousands listen forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin and that will by no means clear the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and to the fourth generation. The third time is in the book of Numbers, chapter 14, verses 18 and 19. Again, listen to the description and the character and nature of a loving and kind and merciful God. The Lord is long suffering and abundant in mercy forgiving iniquity and transgression but he by no means clears the guilty visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation pardon the iniquity of this people I pray according to the greatness of your mercy there it is again just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now and the fourth one is in Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy, by the way, is the second record of the law. Do, deus, do, Deuteronomy, the law, Deuteronomy. Chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation, generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. You see the common denominator in all four? Mercy, loving kindness, forgiveness. Does the Lord visit the iniquity? of those generations yes he does but not for the purpose of punishing not for the purpose of cursing but rather for the purpose of showing mercy and kindness and grace well what follows are several reasons there are no generational curses thank God by the way 
Uh, I think about my own father. If I had to pay for his sins, I wouldn't be standing here right now. And then my poor boys, bless their hearts, <laughs> if they had to pay for my sins as their father, well, we won't talk about that. But um, this is why there are no generational curses, and this is why children are not punished for the sins of the fathers. Number one, the purpose of the Lord visiting the iniquity is to show mercy, forgiveness, compassion. And repeatedly we read that his characteristics are that he's long-suffering and he's slow to anger. I love Gail Irwin. I love Gail Irwin. I love Gail Irwin because he brings this out. The Lord is slow. And he keeps going because he has more breath than I do. <laughs> to anger. <laughs> Abounding in mercy. There, that's just woke up a couple of you. Anyway, welcome back. Number two, the Lord is so compassionate that he visits the children to the fourth generation, third and or fourth generation. Why? Because he knows that the effects can pass on to the fourth generation. The legacy that is left behind the evil that is passed down and that's why he in his compassionate mercy visits the children to that generation and thirdly and interestingly he visits the iniquity of generations of children whose father hated God and he shows mercy to thousands of those who love God in other words he visits the iniquity and he shows mercy to thousands who love God. Does this mean that God turns a blind eye to the evil? Absolutely not. They get their just due. They are re recompensed according to the works they have done, the evil they have done. It's this fourth one that I think again uh, speaks to the um, issue of the finished work of the cross. Um, one cannot, now think about this, one cannot be held responsible for or make payment for the sins of another save Jesus Christ. He was the only one. None are righteous save Jesus Christ, the only one who was righteous. And as such, the only one who could take upon himself the sins of mankind. I like how uh, one commentator said it. Every tub has to stand on its own feet. Of course, those are antique tubs now. The ones that had the feet, probably worth a lot of money now. Uh, number five, even if there was a generational curse, the finished work on the cross would have had to have broken it. Uh, Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no curse to those that are in Christ Jesus. He took upon himself the curse for all our sin and only he could do that. One of the most compelling reasons to me that there's no such thing as a generational curse is there are no examples of it anywhere in scripture. And by that I mean Jesus or Paul never mentioned generational curses, not one time. The book of Acts never shows generational curses dealt with. And the Old Testament prophets never refer to or prophesy about it. And as we're seeing tonight in 1 Kings 15, good kings come from bad and bad kings come from good. And uh, if you want a, a template or a litmus test by which to measure any doctor, I'm going, to, I'm going to try to think of an example here. Um, actually, the SDA church practices this, foot washing. Foot washing. Now, why don't we do foot washing? Okay, number one, in the book of Acts, we don't see the early church doing it. Uh, in the Gospels, we don't see uh, Jesus commanding it. The only ordinance that were, were commanded were water baptism and... Um, uh, 
Not, yeah, but baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and uh, communion, the communion table. The only two ordinances that we see Jesus commanding uh, in the scriptures, not foot washing. And then we also don't see it in the epistles being taught. And we don't see the early church practicing it. And that's really a three-pronged approach or litmus test by which to gauge whether or not something is for today. And interesting, we're talking about the gifts. Really looking forward to um, Sunday morning. We're going to be in part three on our study in the, of the Holy Spirit. But um, the gifts of the Spirit are for today. Why? Take that same three-pronged uh, approach. Uh, did uh, Jesus uh, in the um, uh, Gospels uh, preach it and teach it? Yes, he did. Terry, uh, until the Holy Ghost. In fact, don't do anything until the Holy Ghost comes upon you. Do we see it in the book of Acts? Oh, boy, do we. <laughs> and then do we see it in the epistles? Well, clearly we do, and especially in 1 Corinthians 12, where we're at on Sunday mornings. Well, there's one, one more thing I want to point out. And I alluded to it uh, as we were reading it. But it has to do with where we're told that David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the days of his life, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now, the key word here is except. Now, why do I point that out? Because we're one day going to hear, well done good and faithful servant and we long to hear on that great and final day those words from the Savior enter in well done good and faithful service what we don't want to hear is well done good and faithful servant accept accept and you can fill in the blank that area in our life of willful disobedience that area in our life of sin. Well done, except, except. And is that possible? Yes. We see it here with David. We know David is with the Lord. Clearly, he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. He's with the Lord. We're going to meet him one day, soon, I believe, very soon. But there's an except here. Does that mean that we too could hear that word except? Yes, we could. Well, let's move on. Verse 6. And there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. Now the rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? And there was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. So Abijam rested with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David. Then Asa, his son, reigned in his place. Now, Second Chronicles 13 gives us more details about this Abijam. But it's interesting to note that in Chronicles, his name is spelled with an H instead of an M. And here's why. In Hebrew, this, the name Abijah means Yahweh is my father. You don't pronounce the J in Hebrew. That's why Jerusalem is not Jerusalem. It's Yaru Shalom. Yaru Shalom. Peace. City or, or possession of peace. Abi is father. Abi. Abu in Arabic. Abi in Hebrew. I'm not trying to give you a language lesson here, but this is key because it's going to mean something in a moment. Um, so Abiya means father is Yahweh. Abiya or Abijah. Now, when we get to Chronicles, it's not Abiyah, it's Abiyam. Who's Yam? It's not Yahweh, now it's Yam. Well, in other words, his name was changed to my father is Yam, not Yahweh. Well, Yam was a Canaanite sea god. Now, here's the, the thought. One has suggested that Abiyam, or Abijam, started out as a follower of Yahweh. My father is Yahweh, but ended up turning away from God to this false sea god. There's, the, the nature is the name, and this is a good example of it. 
uh, because he did do that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Verse 9, in the 20th year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, Asa became king over Judah, and he reigned, verse 10, 41 years in Jerusalem. His grandmother's name was Maacha, the granddaughter of Abishalom. Asa did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did his father David. Now, remember when we talked about, of all of the kings in the history of Israel, there were only nine, count them, nine, <laughs> that did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. And out of those nine, only one didn't mess up. As we're going to see, even Asa did towards the end of his life. They start out great. They do that which is right in the eyes of the Lord. They too, of them it will be said, they did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, except for David it was the Uriah the Hittite. With Asa it's going to be something else. And with eight of the nine good kings, eight did that which was right, except there was that one thing they did towards the end of their lives that marred their whole reign. Well, it says that in verse 12, he banished the perverted persons from the land and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. He also removed Maacha, the, his grandmother, from being queen mother. <laughs> Interesting. And here's why. Because she made an obscene image of Asherah, granny, <laughs> Grandma made an obscene image of Asherah. Who's Asherah? Remember, uh, Asherah, Astarte, where we get Easter. This was the sex goddess of fertility that was worshipped in a very sexual way. I won't get graphic. You can Google it on your own. Be careful <laughs> what you'll find. The, the high places, they, basically they were orgies. I don't know how else to say it. And Asa cut down her obscene image and burned it by the brook, brook Kidron. But verse 14, the high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was loyal to the Lord all his days. He also, verse 15, brought into the house of the Lord the things which his father had dedicated and the things which he himself had dedicated, silver and gold and utensils. Now there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Um, this is one of those places in God's word where it can be really easy to read past something and miss the valuable personal application that's in it. And what it is, is and you see it there on the screen, is that Asa does this against his own family. You have to understand that even today in the Middle East, in this culture, this is unthinkable. <laughs> you never do anything against your own family, especially an elder. Father, grandfather, for him to do this would have been unthinkable and extremely difficult. But here we're told that he did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord by taking a stand for righteousness even against his own family and is it not the hardest when it comes to family to take a stand for righteousness he burns down <laughs> I mean I, I'm trying to wrap my mind around his grandmother doing this that's that's I don't even want to think about it that's just weird but anyway verse 17 and Baasha king of Israel came up against Judah and built Ramah that he might let none go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. This is like a blockade. Then Asa, verse 18, took all the silver and gold that was left in the treasuries of the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And King Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tibramon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, who dwelt in Damascus, saying, Let there be a treaty between you and me as there was between my father and your father. See, I have sent you a present of silver and gold. Come and break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, so that he will withdraw from me. 
So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa. This is a very clever plan, by the way. And by the way, it worked. It worked. And actually, the fact that it worked, that's a problem. And we'll see why in a moment. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. He attacked Ion, Dan, Abel, Beit Ba'acha, and all Chinrath with all the land of Naphtali. Verse 21, now it happened when Baasha heard it, that he stopped building Ramah and remained in Tirzah. Then King Asa made a proclamation throughout all Judah. None was exempted. And they took away the stones and the timber of Ramah, which Baasha had used for building. And with them King Asa built Gebba of Benjamin and Mizpah. The rest of all the acts of Asa, all his might, all that he did, and the cities which he built, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Judah? But in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. So Asa rested with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. Then Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. We'll come back to Jehoshaphat in a minute. But here again, we have more details that are provided us in Second Chronicles. And by the way, when we get to Second Chronicles, we're going to revisit this and get more into this. But I do want to talk about uh, some of the details in Second Chronicles because it's a passage that I think is familiar to uh, most, if not all of you. Uh, this was King Asa's downfall. He relied on an alliance instead of relying on God. Early in his reign, when he was not strong militarily, he had to rely on the Lord against this Ethiopian army, a million man strong. He had no other choice. And is that not usually the case? When you don't have any choice, you have to. You're forced to trust the Lord, put your faith in the Lord, rely on the Lord. When you have no money <laughs> to pay the rent, you're forced to trust the Lord. Well, as he grows militarily, God blesses him and prospers him. He becomes strong. He doesn't need to rely on the Lord anymore. And that would end up being his downfall. I want to uh, uh, read for you Second Chronicles chapter 16 verses 4 through 13. You're uh, surely uh, welcome to turn there and follow along. It says, now that, again, this is a lot more details are uh, filled in. A lot more blanks are filled in. So Ben-Hadad heeded King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. They attacked Ion, Dan, Abel, Ma'im, and all the storage cities of Naphtali. Now it happened, when Baasha heard it, that he stopped building Ramah and ceased his work. Then King Asa took all Judah, and they carried away the stones and timber of Ramah, which Baasha had used for building, and with them he built Geba and Mizpah, basically parallel account from what we had in Kings. And at that time, this is not in Kings, Hanani, the seer, came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria, and have not relied on the Lord your God, Therefore, the army of the king of Syria has escaped your hand. Were the Ethiopians and the Lubim not a huge army with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. And this is the verse that is very uh, well known. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. Might I add, fully dependent and reliant upon him. The eyes, of, imagine this, the eyes of the Lord are constantly searching to and fro throughout the entire world, looking for those whose hearts are fully devoted to Him, fully dependent upon Him, fully reliant upon Him. And He says in this to King Asa, you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on, you shall have wars. 
Now look at Asa's response. You would think that he would just fall on his face before the Lord in godly sorrow and repentance and ask for forgiveness and mercy. But what is his response to this seer, this prophet that comes and prophesies to King Asa? We're told that Asa was angry with the seer and put him in prison. For he was enraged at him because of this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at that time. Verse 11, note that the acts of Asa, first and last, are indeed written in the books of the kings of Judah and Israel. And, verse 12, and this is interesting. In the 39th year of his reign, that's a really long reign, compared to some of the kings who did evil, they, God takes them out in two and three years. That's enough. <laughs> they did evil, and, but this good king, for 39 years... Asa became diseased in his feet, and his malady was severe. Some think this was gout. Others suggest other possibilities. Yet, listen to what it says. In his disease, he did not seek the Lord. Of course he didn't. If you're not relying on the Lord, certainly you're not seeking the Lord. If you're not trusting in the Lord, you're not seeking the Lord. And here's what is so interesting is that it implies that would he have but sought the Lord, the Lord would have healed him. But instead of seeking the Lord, he sought the physicians, we're told. And that, that should send chills up and down every single one of our spines. When you think about it, he became, and this is a severe disease in his feet yet his disease in his disease he did not seek the Lord if he would have but sought the Lord instead of the physicians and it cost him his life and it led to his death so verse 13 Asa rested with his fathers he died in the 41st year of his reign now think about that he became diseased in his feet in his 39th year, and he died in his 41st year. If my math is right, he suffered needlessly, unnecessarily, for two years. And if this was a painful malady, and I would believe it was, unnecessary. And think about this. It also implies that God gave him two years to repent, and he didn't. God is, remember, slow to anger. He's not willing that any should perish. He does not take delight in punishing unrighteousness and wickedness. He gave him two years. And in all of that pain and suffering, he relied on the physicians, just like he had relied on his alliance prior. I think the lesson here is, rather clear is it not rely on the Lord not man trust in the Lord not man depend on the Lord not man well verse 17 now Nadab the son of Jeroboam became king over Israel in the second year of Asa king of Judah and he reigned over Israel two years and verse 26 he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin. Then Baasha, the son of Ahijah, the house of Issachar, conspired against him. And Baasha killed him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, while Nadab and all Israel laid siege to Gibbethon. Verse 28, Baasha killed him in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his place. Keep in mind now, we've got two kings, the northern tribes and the southern, because the, the kingdom has been split, and it will remain split for the rest of Israel's history. Verse 29, And it was so, when he became king, that he killed all the house of Jeroboam. He did not leave to Jeroboam anyone that breathed. Does this sound familiar, by the way? Does this sound like a prophecy, by the way? Until he had destroyed him, 
according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite, because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he had sinned, and by which he had made Israel sin, because of his provocation, with which he had provoked the Lord God of Israel to anger. That's interesting, isn't it? That we have the propensity, as God's people, to provoke God to anger. Does that mean that God doesn't love us? No. Think about with your own kids. You can become angry with them, but you still love them. Liking them, that's a different uh, story. But you, <laughs> you can... They, let's move on. <laughs> Verse 31. <laughs> now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, are they not written in the books of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, Baasha, the son of Ahijah, became king over all Israel in Tirzah and reigned 24 years. That's a long time to be evil. Because <laughs> we're told in verse 34, he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of Jeroboam and in his sin by which he had made Israel sin. So the chapter ends with the first of what will end up being a total of nine dynasties that ruled Israel over a period of about 250 years. And here's what's sad. These dynasties, with the exception of a few, led Israel into unspeakable evil against the Lord. And it's evidenced pretty graphically, in graphic detail, by Israel's history. I think the takeaway tonight is very simply this by way of a personal application. You can never, ever underestimate the importance of walking in obedience. And I know I have been saying it almost every week for the last three weeks now. But the one thing that we can give God that he does not necessarily have, God has everything. God knows everything. The one thing we can give him that he doesn't necessarily have is our obedience our obedience. And when a child of God walks in obedience and walks in a way that is pleasing in the sight of the Lord, I picture God just finding that irresistible. He cannot resist it. He just blesses that life. He blesses that life abundantly, exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that could ever be imagined, let alone asked. And we see it throughout scripture. God blesses obedience, but God cannot bless disobedience. Why don't you stand? We'll pray. Lord, thank you again for your word and for the lessons that we can take home with us tonight from this chapter. Lord, we can't leave it there though, as sometimes is our tendency to do. We need for you by the Holy Spirit to begin that process in our lives, to begin to apply this to our lives. Lord, we want to be numbered amongst those of whom it is said, they did that which was pleasing in the sight of the Lord. And Lord, let there never be an accept to that. Let there just be a period on the end of that there not be anything like except or however or but or if <laughs> Lord we want to please you we want to walk in obedience with you and Lord we thank you in Jesus name Amen